Praise God this morning, he's all we need. Amen. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 13 this morning. Um, in our bulletin, each month we put a uh, memory verse of the month. Um, this month our memory verse has been uh, Proverbs 13 verse number 12. I'm going to read you several um, uh, verses of scripture here, but I really want to focus on verse number 12 of chapter 13, and I know you might say, well, preacher, you preached on that about five or six weeks ago or something, and I did use this verse as our text, but we use uh, the part that day, when the desire cometh. Um, this verse says, when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Um, we use the first part of that verse. Today I want to speak to you concerning the second part, concerning the tree of life. So if you'll all stand with me, if you're able, uh, this morning in honor of the reading of God's Word. Proverbs chapter 13, we're going to begin in verse 12, in verse 10, excuse me, verse 10. Everybody there this morning say amen. amen. Alright, the scripture reads, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is the tree of life. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Every prudent man dealeth with, not with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is held. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. But it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your presence in your house today. And God, I just pray right now that you'll get me out of the way, that you'll Lord, give us the anointing that makes preaching effective, and you'll speak to your people today, um, Lord, through us. We love you, and we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. One thing I like about the book of Proverbs is, is that anybody can understand it. Let me tell you something. Uh, Solomon, in writing this, you know, in the Scripture says he was the wisest king that Israel ever had. And I believe that the reason that the Bible says that is because he had so much wisdom, which was a God-given wisdom. We all uh, probably most know the story that um, you know, God had granted him one thing, that he could have one thing, and, and Solomon asked for wisdom. Well, you could look at his life and you could say, well, he probably wasn't too wise. First of all, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. In my eyes, that would seem like a foolish man. I, mean, I don't know about you, but it's all I can do to handle one wife and no concubines. Amen? Uh, let me tell you. So anyway, I don't know. Uh, what the thinking was there, but we read in his in the scripture that uh, the Holy Spirit inspired to give Solomon. When you uh, read in the Proverbs and you read the Song of Solomon and you read the Book of Ecclesiastes, all three of those coming from him. Let me say the one thing that I find in common with all of that is that they are easy to read and easy to understand. Now, when we get into the Book of Proverbs here, what I like especially about it is that he tells you what will happen on one hand. If you live this way or act this way or do this thing, this will happen. 
But on the other, if you want to flip the other side of the coin, he also tells you that if you act this way, or if you do that, or if you don't do this, that this is what will happen. Folks, that's, that's the kind of teaching I need. Why? Because it's simple. I think that's why the Bible says that he was one of the wise, it was the wisest king of Israel, and no doubt one of the wisest men that this world has ever seen for that fact, because he had not only so much knowledge, but he had God given wisdom. You can read in the scripture many times where he says that wisdom is precious, wisdom is a lot rubies, it's finer than rubies. It's finer than gold. He compares it to many of the things that man and uh, men and women cherish in their own personal lives, which are nothing more than temporary things, but he compares wisdom to that and tells us that wisdom is so much greater than those things if it can be acquired in your life. Now, this is no doubt one of my favorite passages of Scripture because it says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. If you have ever lived, and and, and, and we all have, but if you are a person who remembers back in your life before your relationship with Jesus Christ, or even as a Christian before totally surrendering your heart and life to God and to the ministry and to what He would have planned for your life, Let me tell you something, it's a a terrible thing uh, to be miserable, to be sick in spirit because you're not serving the Lord when you know you should be. It can make us very sick. And in doing that, our hope is deferred. So that's how he begins this verse that we're going to look at today. And he says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Now if you go into the Scripture and you are a a Bible reader or a studier of the Word, the Bible mentions many times things about the tree of life. Actually in the book of Proverbs in chapter 3 verse 18 it says that wisdom that we just talked about, that wisdom is a tree of life. It goes on and it says in Proverbs 11.30 that the fruit of righteousness is the tree of life. Well, we all know today as we, um, as they sing and as we have talked about many times over and over that our, the Bible says in Isaiah uh, 64, 6, it says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So folks, it's not talking about the fruit of our righteousness is a tree of life. It's talking about the fruit of righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ can be a tree of life in your walk with Him, in your relationship to Him, in your relationship to this world that we live in. His righteousness. Not depending on our works or our knowledge or our good deeds or our or even our wisdom, let me say, because uh, every good and uh, perfect gift comes from above, the Bible says, in the book of James. So anything good about any of us comes from the Lord. Do you believe that this morning? If you do, look at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, it's all about Him. It's about His righteousness. It's not about what we did or what we've done or even what we're going to do. Praise God. It's about what He did. It's about what He continues to do. And it's what He is going to do in our future, folks. And let me say it to you, that is hope. That is a future. That is an expected end. Praise God. That is the tree of life that grows up and sprouts up and grows and matures and produces fruit in our life. Because this morning, and just tell you, neighbor, one more time, neighbor, it's all about Him. Look at the one on the other side and say, hey, neighbor, it ain't about you. You know, we're all born with an instinct with with what we call human nature. You know, I've shared with you many times, you know, nobody had to teach me how to lie. It came naturally. 
Nobody had to teach me how to steal bubble gum from the candy store. I remember uh, we used to go to Oconee State Park at the first uh, church my daddy pastored, and I was about five years old, and sometimes, they, it, you know, back then you could take your kids and leave them somewhere. And they would take us sometimes and leave us at the state park there. They had lifeguards and all that kind of stuff, and we'd go out there and go swimming. Well, I'll tell you what, as soon as I got hot and tired of swimming and all that, I was down there at that little general store they had, filling my pockets full of candy and bubble gum and didn't have a penny in my name. Nobody had to teach me that. It came natural. Folks, we're naturally, we're naturally, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart above all things is deceitful and desperately wicked. Folks, it's talking about that life. It's talking about us, the human nature that's in us. But praise God uh, today that Jesus provided a way for us to escape that human nature and, and enter into us a divine nature that we may become more like Him. As Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. Folks, let me tell you something. When you become a Christian, you get a desire for the things of God, not the things of the world. You get a desire to partake in fellowship with God, not with the world. Let me tell you something. This world is not my home, praise God. I'm just passing through. And I hope we understand that this morning. His righteousness. Anything good about any of us is His righteousness. Proverbs 15.4 says this, and this might be a verse you want to bring to memory or mark down in your Bible. It says that a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. What it's talking about is when we have respectable conversation, when we know, are you one of those people that, like myself, that I don't always know when to speak and when not to speak? Am I the only one? There ain't none of y'all out there like that. Let me tell you something. I don't always say the right thing at the right time or do the right thing at the right time. And sometimes I even, you know, sometimes that old, I'll just use Scripture, you know, the, 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 the Spirit is willing all the time, but praise God, sometimes this old flesh gets weak. Sometimes that old man, you know, you know that old man? Any of y'all got the old man or the old woman that still lives in there, that still, you know, you buried him, but sometimes he wants to dig his way out and sometimes he wants to appear and maybe that temper, uh, you know, might flare up a little bit or, or you might get to a place where you're not uh, really representing God in the right way or saying the right thing or doing the right thing. The Bible says uh, that a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. What he's saying when we learn how to discipline ourselves, when we learn how to control ourselves. Paul used it this way. Paul said, I bring my body into subjection. What he was talking about was he was talking about uh, fasting in that Scripture, but he was talking about I'm training my body to do what I know is right. I'm training my body, my mind, my spirit, everything about me to, to live a life of godliness. You know, as I read and study the Bible, there, there was, uh, I began to think about some uh, different ways that the Scripture talks about different trees of life. And I want probably one of the uh, uh, most uh, familiar things you would know of is the tree that was found in the Garden of Eden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, and we know most of us, or not, if not all of us, know the story how that, um, you know, that uh, Adam and Eve were, uh, God had blessed them with a perfect world, put them in a perfect environment, and He had uh, told them, look, you can have anything here. They looked, they didn't have to work the garden, they didn't have to do any of that. They were there just to enjoy life. They were there to enjoy communion and fellowship with God. And God only put one stipulation on it. He said, you can have anything in this garden. You can do anything you want in this garden. He said, but whatever you do, don't touch that tree. 
But folks, that old human nature. Y'all remember when your mama and daddies would tell you not to do so and so? You know, and we all, what did we all, what, what did the human nature in us tell us? Well, if they don't want me doing it, they must be something good about it. Right? I was that way, I'm sure you were that way. So what did they do? That was the very thing, very tree that they messed with. And they found out through that what sin was. They found out through that they brought sin, no doubt, into the world. Let me tell you something. That is what we call the fall of mankind. That is what we call is what messed up everything, you know. And we have a habit. The church has the habit. Preachers have the habit. Sunday school teachers have the habit. We all tend to blame it on Adam, do we not? And those that don't want to blame it on Adam, hey, we get like some of us husbands do. We just blame it on our wife. Right? We blame it on Eve. But folks, let me tell you something. If Adam hadn't have done it, if Eve hadn't have done it, if Abraham hadn't have done it, if anybody else hadn't have done it, guess who would have? You? Me? We would have wanted to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because as Satan the serpent said, he said, if you eat of the fruit, you shall be like God. And he don't want you to know what he knows. Folks, and now aren't we that kind of people that we always trying to figure God out? Let me tell you something. Don't try to figure God out. Just love Him. You'll never figure Him out. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But let me tell you something today. You can experience the presence of God in your life. You can experience the working of the Holy Spirit in you that will not only change your world, but will change the world around you. If you'll let Him. That day, The tree of knowledge and good and evil, let me tell you, that was the tree of life. Because as you know and as I know, this world that we live in today is full of good and evil. I couldn't, uh, just right before church today, um, you know, a couple of folks in the church were sharing with me some of the stuff that went on last week that I wasn't even aware of right here in our own little neighborhood, you know, and I was just like, man, that stuff like that's not supposed to happen around here. But folks, let me tell you something. Evil is everywhere. Nobody's exempt from it. Nobody can run from it. We live, or the Bible says, or Christ said it like this, or the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to say it like this. He said that we should re- redeem the time because the days of evil are approaching. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, Neighbor, it's here. It's here. Folks, there's nothing I can think of that even if it happened in this own little farming community that we live in, that would surprise me. Folks, because sin is everywhere. Evil is everywhere. Hey, the devil, uh, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. In Genesis chapter 35, we find a story there of the children of, of the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel had, Jacob was leading them, and they had strayed away from God. They had um, went into Shechem, and they had begun to intermarry and things like that. And what wound up happening, because um, they wasn't in the place that God had for them, his daughter wound up getting raped, and a different, there's all kind of terrible things began to happen to them in Shechem and um, they brought in this family into their family, into God's family if you want to say that and, and in the scripture God tells, um, tells him, he says what you need to do Jacob, you need to get back to Bethel he said you need to get back to the place where you left me 
You need to get back to the place that I had designed for you. And if you read the Scripture, He gathers all of Israel together and He tells them this. He tells them, take off all your earrings. Take off all your jewelry. Take off all, all of your stuff that you collected and gained since you got here, which was, a, uh, which was signifying the fact of all the sin that they had added and put onto their life. And what Jacob did, he took all of that stuff and he found a big oak tree, the Bible says, in Shechem there. And he took and he buried all of this stuff. And he buried their clothes. He buried their garments. And he told them to change their garments. Put on clean clothes because they was going to repent and get back to where God wanted them to be. Folks, that big oak tree in Shechem was a tree of life for the nation of Israel in that time. In Luke chapter 10, you can read, and we're familiar, we learned this as a, as a child. We hear about this man named Zacchaeus. Anybody know what Zacchaeus did? You know, we know that we little man was he. Climbed up in the sycamore tree, right? Why? For the Lord he wanted to see. You know, we learned that. Folks, let me tell you something. That sycamore tree uh, that Zacchaeus climbed up in, it was a tree of life. Why? Well, he may have just entered into it or climbed it because of curiosity of who this man Jesus was. But let me tell you, that tree became a place of decision because Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree because I'm going to your house today. And he went to his house. And you read the story in Luke chapter 10. It became a place where this father, where this man made the right decision for Christ. And he gave his heart and gave his life unto Christ. And the Bible says that his whole family was saved. It was a tree of life. Folks, And then the most familiar tree that we know of today is the one that God grew. The one that was meant for me. The one that was meant for you. I've shared this with you before. Could you, with all, you know, you think about in biblical times all the things that trees were used for. You know, they were used to build the temple. They were used to build houses many times. Carts. Everything that was done, so many things that was done, was done with wood from trees. I'd hate to know how many references. I didn't look, up, look it up. But there, I would hate to know how many references are in the Bible concerning trees. The cedars of Lebanon. All these different things that they used it for. Can you imagine the care that God took to grow the tree that was meant for me that was meant for you you say why preacher we're not of importance let me say this to you first of all yes you are to him but even greater than that it was a tree that he knew that his son would one day hang on why? Because he would take my tree and your tree. He would make what was meant for us and he would take it as his own. He would embrace it. He would embrace the cross. See, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That if we would just believe, that if we would just put our faith and trust in the finished work of the cross. You know, I began to think about just uh, yesterday actually as I was reading and studying uh, and I thought about this fact, you know, and, and it's a true statement no doubt and it's a very meaningful, powerful, it's a life-changing statement as we often tell people, you need to put uh, your faith and trust in Christ, Right? Do y'all believe that's a true statement today? You, in order to be saved, you need to put your faith and trust in Christ. In order to be saved, you need to put your faith and your trust in Christ. If you believe that, say amen. 
But folks, I believe uh, many times in saying that, we leave one of the most important parts of salvation out. And that is this life that I now live. Uh, Galatians 2.20, read it. The life that I now live, I live in the flesh, but I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So not only do you need to put your faith and your trust in Christ in order to be saved, you need to put your faith and your trust in the finished work of the cross that Christ did so that you might live a life that is pleasing to Him. Live a life that is fulfilling to you and is satisfying to you. Look what verse number 19 says. It says the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. We live in a world where people are are popping pills and taking medicine and going to doctors and all these things trying to find peace and joy and comfort and happiness in their heart. Let me tell you something. Put your faith in Christ. Put your faith in the finished work of the cross. Live for Him. Praise God. And the tree of life will be your healing. If you don't believe it, let's turn over to Revelation chapter 22. Oh, y'all turned there, so you must not believe it. I got you, didn't I? Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. says this. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bare twelve minor fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now you say, preacher, are you taking that scripture way out of context? Because this is after the, this is after, uh, the, uh, uh, the rapture of the church? Yes, it is. You say, well, preacher, this is even after uh, the, the seven years of tribulation in the battle of Armageddon. Yes, it is. You say, preacher, this is even after, as I read the Scripture, this is after the new heaven and the new earth, after new Jerusalem came down. Uh, preacher, this all oh, this is talking about after that. Yes, it is. But folks, I want to remind you of a passage of Scripture that Jesus, that you'll find in your Bibles written in red, because it was the words of Jesus that He said this. He said, church, He said, I will build upon this rock. I will build my church. He wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking to Peter. He said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Y'all remember that? What he was talking about is I will build my church upon the the, uh, faith in the finished work of the cross. I will build my faith, I will build my church upon your belief in what Jesus did and the fact that you believe it with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your spirit. And He says this, and He says, And I will give unto you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And what you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Folks, what he is saying is that you have access. You have access to everything that God has, to everything that God is. The Scripture says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, folks. You have the power now if you'll just release it. To live a life. That's pleasing to you to find comfort, to find joy, to find happiness. Let me tell you, one of the greatest acts of faith I ever seen was from a girl that I had met, and um, when we pastored our first church, and this uh, there was a man and woman that lived up the road there from the church, and somebody had told me, well, actually, I would see her and I asked about her, but I would see every day when I was 
on my way to church, there was this be this girl out there in the morning. I mean, this is like seven o'clock in the morning, and she's walking around a cornfield. I'd see her every morning out there, what just walking around that field, and um, you know, and I, if I'd leave to go somewhere, seemed like nine times out of ten she'd be out there walking. And I asked somebody, because I didn't know the family, and I asked somebody about it, and they said, well, she's a little, a little crazy. You know, said she was in a bad car wreck, and, and this and that, and it messed her up, is the story they told me. And so anyway, a few months later, and it, it was for a totally different reason, I went and visited this, to go visit this man and woman, and that girl answers the door. And me and her begin to talk, and she begins to tell me, a lot of what I had already heard, but it wasn't, her ver- wasn't the version I heard. And she began to tell me about how she would walk the field, and she said, when I walk this field, you know, I'm just uh, trying to figure, I'm trying to find some peace, I'm trying to find some joy. And she, as I got to know her and visit her several times, she got to tell me how she was on, I think it was 18 different medications. And probably most of them was fighting against each other. That happens all the time. Why? Because people don't want to take the time for you to give you what you need. They want to take your money and get you out of their office so many times. So they had this girl on 18 uh, different medications and she started coming to the church and we started praying with her and we started working with her and she cold turkey quit 18 medications. Under her own will, under her own. I didn't direct her to do that. I didn't ask her to do that. All I asked her to do was trust God in the finished work of the cross. Because see, my Bible tells me in Isaiah 53, praise God, by His stripes I can be healed. Folks, it doesn't say just spiritually. Let me tell you something. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There is a, a help with your finances in the name of Jesus. But what's got to come is the desire. When the desire cometh, it's a tree of life. See, we live in a world that tells us to accept less when God has planned for you so much more. We live in churches today. We attend churches every day. Uh, Every week that five or ten people a year are getting saved in. And you know what our attitude is as, as Christians? We say, well, that's better than the church down the street. Ain't nobody getting saved down there. We have accepted less. Folks, if just one, if every Christian in this room could just win one person to Jesus, this coming year. Could you imagine what it would be like? We accept less. Folks, when God has got so much more. The leaves of the tree in heaven are for healing. Folks, let me tell you something. Your healing today is not based on God. I just want to put it that way. It's not if God decides to heal you or not. When I use that word healing, I'm using it again in a very general way. Whether it be spiritual, whether it be physical, whether it be financial, whether it be your marriage, whether it be in your workplace, no matter what it is, your healing today is not based upon if God can do it or not. It's based on your desire. And I'm not saying your desire to be healed. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about your desire to love Him. Your desire to live for Him. See, I know a whole lot of people that don't get much out of their Bible when they read it. You want me to tell you why? Because they ain't got no desire for it. Why you only pick it up once a week or one minute a day? I know a lot of people that have told me over the years, you know, preacher, I just don't get a whole lot out of church. 
I just don't get a whole lot out of preaching or I just don't get a whole lot out of praise music or I don't just get a whole lot out of the choir or I don't get a whole lot out of Sunday school. You know why? Because the desire is not there. Does that make sense to you? When the desire cometh, it'll be a tree of life. When worship becomes important to you, it won't be just about you raising your hands or you shouting or you saying amen. When the desire cometh, when you get to the place where you want to worship, praise God, God will show up in your worship. When you get to the place when you want to learn more of the Bible, hey, let me tell you something. You won't just read a little bit of it every day. You'll study it and seek the face of God through it. You'll attend Sunday school. You'll attend Wednesday night. When you get a desire, let me say, when the desire cometh, it'll be a tree of life. In your situation. And the leaves thereof will be for the healing. And I'll just use what the Scripture says of the nations. Folks, let me tell you something today. You know, do y'all agree with me that it's very unfortunate, but in the way our world works today, the church don't have a whole lot of say-so, does it? You know, I've always told people concerning the separation of church and state, we use that thing completely opposite of what it was written for. So let me say to you today, when the the reason that has taken place is because churches are full of people who have no desire to put God first. We want to make Him a small part of our Something we do on Sunday morning for a couple hours. Something we may do at night when we lay our head down to bed and pray a one or two minute prayer. In the morning when we get up or when we sit at the table and say our blessing. or Something like that. But folks, I'm talking to you about something way bigger than that. I'm talking to you about a desire. To not just read the Word, but to become the Word. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. The day has come when God seeketh such to worship Him as He will worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's the kind of worshiper of God. And you say, well, preacher, I'm not one to raise my hands. I'm not one to shout. That's not even what I'm talking about. The kind of worship that I'm talking about today. Look, we worship. We're all wired to worship. I hope we understand that. That's the way God made every single person. Whether you're lost or saved, you're wired to worship. Now where you put that worship towards, that's totally up to you. God gives you that opportunity or that choice to make. Some people are worshiping money. And you know because they worship it, they make a lot of it. Right? The desire comes, that becomes their tree of life. Let me say some people are, are very educated people and they worship their knowledge and let me say, and, and their wisdom, and, and they take that stuff, if you want to say, and they worship it so much, that's what's so important to them, that they take that and they go what the world looks at to the highest level with it. They flourish in it. It becomes a tree of life. Why? Because there's a desire. I'll just use my, me and my wife, for example. Um, most of y'all probably don't know this, if any of you. Today's our 34th wedding anniversary. I've been looking for this day for a long time. And I haven't even shared this with her. I've been looking for, forward to this day for a long time. And the reason that is is because the first 17 years of our marriage, I treated her like dirt. I treated God like dirt. 
It was all about me. And I'll even say I treated my daughter like dirt. Well, I didn't give her the love that her daddy should have. But today, Sunday, today, July the 28th, we've evened out because the last 17 has been great. And it ain't because anything i done or anything she done, praise God, it's because of her and I. It's because of what he does, what he continues to do. And let me tell you something, what I know he's going to do. Because we have a hope. And I'm not deferring my hope, are you? Hey, some of you got kids that might be acting out a little bit. You might, you might have kids or grandkids that need to be saved. Don't give up hope. Because hope deferred makes the heart sick. Some of you got a dead end job. You sick of that job, you tired of that boss, you tired of facing that every day, don't give up hope. Why? Because hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Some of you might be sick of your spouse. Hey, that's just the reality, right? I get bet my wife can tell you don't give up hope. Because hope deferred will make the heart sick. Folks, let me tell you, when the desire cometh, it's a tree of life. And its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Folks, it is God. If you just make Him number one. You say, well, preacher, how do I get that desire? Let me say this. It don't come from you. I'll just read that verse of Scripture in closing to you this morning. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It says I die. That's basically saying I died, but now I live. I died, but I live. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, it's not me. But Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, in this old body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. What He's saying in that Scripture there is if you just have the desire and realize where your help comes from, just look at your neighbor this morning and say, Neighbor, my help comes from the Lord. He's the only one that can give you the desire. You can come to church till you blue in the face. You can come to church now till Jesus comes back. Until you get the desire and realize who is the giver of desire, it ain't going to make a difference in your life. You're going to sit in that pew. You're going to continue to be miserable. Why? Because you're not experiencing the benefit of what the church is supposed to be. A place where like-minded believers come in to express their worship of God. But God, it's all about you. It's nothing about me. When you make it like that, God begins to pour into you. And what God does is God don't make it about Him. He makes church about you. To benefit of it. That's why we say, I surrender all. Let's stand this morning if you.